we have approximately 172 uh, green cards in support of people who uh, w did not wish to speak. Um, and then we also, of course, heard uh, in opposition uh, from Shannon Dearman and Sheriff Grom Greg Champagne from the Louisiana Sheriff's Association. Uh, we have around nine uh, cards uh, uh, in opposition. President will provide information if requested, and those there are going to be in the record. Uh, we also have another email, and we'll continue whatever emails that we have received. Uh, we're going to go ahead and place those into the permanent record uh, of of this did you, committee. So, um, did you read the cards in opposition? Uh, we we have a hundred and seventy over a hundred and oh the, no, to read no. the cards in opposition. There are about uh, nine. Go ahead. I'd like you to read them. Okay, I will. We're going to, uh, we have, President will provide information for requested Michael Renas, Executive Director, Louisiana Sher uh, Sheriff's Association, not wishing to speak, President in opposition, Lauren Lampert, Louisiana District Attorney's Association, not wishing to sp speak, Mark, uh, President and in opposition, Mark Oxley, Louisiana State Troopers Association, not wishing to speak, President and in opposition, Kevin Hayes on behalf of the Chiefs of Police, not wishing to speak, present and in opposition, Logan Coulon, Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. Not wishing to speak, present and in opposition, Mike Barnett, Louisiana Sheriff's Association. Not wishing to speak, present and in opposition, Gary Bennett, Louisiana Sheriff's Association. Not wishing to speak, present and in opposition, Fabian Blosch, uh, Executive Director, Louisiana Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, and Carrie Chandler, uh, who are you asking the question of? What, will he take a question on close? Because then it's going to open up other questions on close, and we have to get to the floor. And I we just want to know if it's perspective only or not. That's my only question. He can he can comment to that on closing. Uh, we also have a email email uh, vote no for HB fifty one by Carrie Chandler. Uh, so that's in the record. So, um, Representative Jordan. Uh, All right. So. First of all, I want to thank all the members for your time in hearing this. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, to Representative Hodges, my condolences to you and your family. I, I certainly did not know that, and so I want to uh, certainly extend that on the record. Um, I want to be clear about a couple of things, though. Let me just say this. This is not... And, and we, we use the term bad cops, bad apples. This is about law enforcement officers who have violated people's constitutional rights. I don't want to lose the importance of that. We're talking about constitutional violations. So well, respectfully, I heard the sheriff and, and the attorney for the Sheriff's Association, but I'm, I'm with Judge Carter on that. I, I think he's worried about an issue that doesn't even apply to this. Um, I've heard them, uh, I, heard, I think I heard the young lady say that, the, the lady say that there would be increased, maybe significant increased costs by insurance or something of that nature. You know, my response to that is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of surprised because, I, I mean, I think that's almost like an admission of there's a lot of misconduct going on. But, but I will say this. I talked to another sheriff who was on the, of the opinion that the cost would be less than a half a percent of his budget. So I think, and I think that's probably right. I think the cost are minimal. But I, I, I do want to read a couple of things, and, and, I'll, and I'll start with my closing. Um, I want to read the, the letter from Congressman Richmond because I read this this morning, and I, and I, I think it's important that it be read, so, so I'm going to read it. It was 91 when the movie Boys in the Hood came out, and the last line in the movie said, either they don't know, they don't show, or they don't care about what happens in the hood. Well, if you didn't know, now you know. The numerous videos showing what's happening, showing you what's happening, 
So then you go through the last line and the real question is, do you care? I care. And everyone else should too. Enough is enough. I've had some more time to think since the hearing in Congress last week on police reform and came across a quote from the director of that movie, the late John Singleton. He said, the freshest moments in my films have always been with unknown actors. Actors are not only in movies and plays. Each one of us in it is an actor in the one life God gave us. George Floyd was an unknown actor. Tamir Rice was an unknown actor. Breonna Taylor was an unknown actor. Alton Sterling was an unknown actor. It's time for us to remove the immunity that gives police the impunity to take the unknown among us from their families. The U.S. Supreme Court created qualified immunity in 1967 in its ruling of Pearson v. Ray. No one disagrees that police officers have difficult jobs requiring split-second decisions based upon limited information. However, qualified immunity came into being prior to the militarization of the police. No knock search warrants, stop and frisk, and the war on drugs. It did, however, come into being during a time when the U.S. Supreme Court was focused on protecting the constitutional rights of individuals. In the beginning, qualified immunity could have had its place. The court never would have dreamed what this well-intentioned policy choice would become. In 1982, the U.S. Supreme Court expanded qualified immunity beyond all recognition in Harlow v. Fitzgerald. Essentially, the court said that as long as no police officer in your area of the country has violated the constitutional rights of a person in exactly the precise way you just did, then it's open season on the citizenry of the United States. Since 1982, it has been practically impossible to sue police a police officer even when the court admits they violated the Constitution. And the congressman adds emphasis there. Every year, new outrages are perpetrated, and every year police are shielded by immunity the way police are supposed to shield children like 12-year-old Tamir Rice. Eventually, after every possible constitution violate, constitutional violation has been committed by police, in every region of the country, I suppose this problem will resolve itself. But I, for one, am not willing to wait for that or tolerate the untold resulting carnage and pain. The late Justice Antonin Scalia and I have very different judicial philosophies. Justice Clarence Thomas and I have very different judicial philosophies. However, the three of us agree on the fact that qualified immunity has expanded so far that it gives the American citizens practically no redress when the police violate their constitutional rights. Not only is this something that can be fixed, it can be fixed now. Change at the federal level is slow, but here I know it's not. I sit where you sit now. We worked together to quickly right the wrongs that we saw in the world because while we were from different regions of the state and different political viewpoints, we were all from Louisiana and instinctively knowing something is just flat out wrong for our great state. Here, we do not have filibusters and grand national campaigns. Here we have each other and we all know right from wrong. The next victims of police violence will almost certainly be unknown actors. It is up to the rest of us to act on their behalf and take whatever steps we can to end police violence. This is one small step 
but it is the step that is before us today. Many of you here have been upset that contact tracing or wearing a mask could violate your constitutional rights. Without getting into the merits of that argument, you would have redress in the courts and likely the court would get to the merits of the case. Isn't the taking of a life a much more egregious violation? I'm not attempting to say that it can only happen to African Americans. It can happen to anyone, but it is much more likely to happen to African Americans. The harsh reality is that many of you would not tolerate for five minutes your child being policed the way I fear my son will be policed. I fear it because even today, sitting as a U.S. congressman, it still happens to me. The least that can be done is to give him an opportunity to protect his constitutional rights. Is what you would want for your child. Ladies and gentlemen, that's from a U.S. congressman. It's not a former U.S. congressman. That's not somebody that's 80 years old. That's somebody that, that has served in his very house and that is, is younger than some of us here. And that's the fear that he has for his son. That's the fear that I have for his son. That's the fear I have for Ted's daughter. That's the same fear I have for Dustin's son. You know, I had some of you have talked to me and you said the timing was not right. You know, that gets me to something that, because we all like to quote Dr. King. So I'm, I'm going to give you all a little bit of King because I know that's, that's what folks like. He says, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. Tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there's such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. He went on later in that speech to say, we refuse to believe the bank of justice is bankrupt. I think if I were talking to Dr. King today, he might have a different opinion. I, I really do. Because that was in 1963 and this is 2020 and we're still fighting the same issues. Have we made some progress? We've made some. People always like to point to that we've elected an African American president as if that's the end all be all of all of this. That we're post-racial. We're not. And I'm not trying to make this a race matter because I like Ron Haley. I've represented people in this. I've represented African Americans. I've, rep I've had white clients as well that have suffered at the hands of, of police brutality. But again, just like the congressman said, it's much more likely to happen to us. Now, I know you all have your, your reasons for whatever you may do, and you've earned the right to do that because people have sent you here. But people have also sent me here. People have sent all of these folks who are standing with me. And I just want to say, I want to thank those, those young kids, BR for the people. Because I told them before we came in here, protest without policy is dead. And I've said that, I've said just like I've said, faith without works is dead. We have to show them a better way. We have to be an example for them. So I will tell you, I, I am at peace with the example that I've set for them regardless of the outcome of this decision. But I'm going to leave you with this. And I'm no, I'm no biblical scholar, so I'm going to read this. But because he wished to justify himself. Well, let me back up. 
That was a scholar of the law, because I want to make sure I get this all right. Mm -hmm. Who said the testament said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit an eternal life? I see you shaking your head, Patrick. I think you're going to like this. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he said in reply, you shall love your God, your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levi came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged him. Then he lifted him on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instructor to take care of him. If you spend more than what, you've, what I've given you, I shall repay you on the way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered the one who treated him with mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. You know, when I first read that, and I came in, I was thinking about what I was going to say. My question really was to you, who is it that, that, who is it that are our neighbors? Or you are our neighbors? But you know what? I think I actually misread it. The real question is, do you see yourself as the Samaritan or the victim? The question really becomes, if you can't see yourself at the, as the victim, you could never be the Samaritan. Until you can see yourself in that person, you will never have empathy for that person. So the real question is, until you can see yourselves in us, that's nothing that you could do for us. But I know that this body is willing to move forward. I know that this body wants to, wants to improve. I know that this body wants to make progress. So I'm going to pray. But again, and I'm going to have faith. But like I said, faith without works is dead. So I'm going to hope today that we're going to all be alive. And however you vote, however we get to move forward, that we're going to move forward. And at some point, Something touches your heart that you see yourselves in us and us in you so that I don't have to worry about what happens to my son or my daughter or Ted's daughter or Royce's daughter or Dustin's children or whomever else that there is that's here. I'm hoping we don't have to worry about one of them being the victim because you know what's going to happen when you do that? You're going to say, man. I'm so sorry that that happened to you and to your family. Question is, when you had a chance to do something, what did you do? I'm going to ask for your favorable passage. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Who's moving favor? Representative Jenkins has moved to report House Bill 51 fa favorably, uh, to which Representative Amadi has objected. Do you have a point of order? Okay. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Representative Amadi? No. no. Representative Robert Carter? 
Yes. Yes. Representative Wilford Carter. Yes. Yes. Representative De Villiers. No. No. Representative Eccles. No. No. Representative Emerson. No. No. Representative Freeman. No. No. Representative Hodges. No. No. Representative pa Jefferson. Amen. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Representative Jenkins. Yes. Yes. Representative Johnson. No. No. Representative Landry. Yes. Yes. Representative Muscarello. No. No. Representative Nelson. Yes. Yes. Representative Presley. Yes. yes. Representative Seabaugh. No. No. I have seven yeas and nine nays. All right. Uh, with that, uh, that bill motion fails. Uh, I, I just want to take one, one point. Uh, Representative Jordan, this is just the start of vigorous action. You have my commitment with the speaker's support that we will work with you and all the supporters and all the sheriff's official and police law enforcement. Uh, and that is not a blind promise. Uh, it, we will dedicate the time that we need to this issue during the interim. And I don't even want to call it a study request. You've got my commitment. I assure you of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you.